say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. You need Hello, everyone, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and yes, sir, yes, ma'am, we have an outstanding show. She's back by popular demand. Oh, you said we love her. She's outstanding. Well, she's back, and her name is Maureen Metcalf. Oh, yeah, baby. She is fantastic. She is the CEO and founder of the the Innovative Leadership Institute. She is going to blow your doors off again, right? We are going to have just so much fun with her. She is absolutely fantastic. I am telling you, this book, I, there was a reason why we brought it back for this book, right? The Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations is the name of the book. The reason why we brought her back is because literally so many of you have said, you've got to bring her back. She's really, really good. Well, she, she, you know, against her better judgment, and Maureen really does not have bad judgment, but against her better judgment, I begged, and she said, sure, I'll come back on your show. And I thought, oh, <laughs> yeah, that may not be good. But anyway, it's going to be awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun with Maureen. You're going to love her. We're going to, we're, oh gosh, it's just going to be great. But you know what? Before we get to Maureen, let's do what we do every week, right? Here we are in the midst of this, uh, I guess, pandemic. I, I don't know what else to call it. But, you know, we, we've been doing the last month, several months, right? Because it's been several months since we started this thing, right? The last several months, what we, what, what we, are, what we are doing here is we are uh, talking about your training, right? How are you, how are you training? And, and, and how are you training in the four areas of your life, right? Because what we've learned in the past from previous authors, especially those, those guys who, you know, talked to us who were in special forces like Delta Force or, you know, Navy SEALs or, you know, special operations forces, Green Berets, you know, every one of them said the same thing, right? When things go bad, when things get rough, when things get tough, when you're exhausted, when you are at the end of your road, the only thing you have to rely on is your training. And that's it. And you train in four areas of your life. You train physically, you train mentally, you train emotionally, and you train spiritually. And, and if you're not constantly training, right, the problem is when things get really, really bad, what are you going to have? What can you really rely on? So, and, and Maureen talks about this even too, is that as leaders, you know, if you're going to be resilient, you know, in your, in your training as a leader, if you're going to be a great leader, you have to have resilience and you can't have resilience if you're not training every area of your life, right? So we're going to look at the four areas of your training. I'm going to ask you the same question, all four areas. How is your training going on a scale of one to 10? One is miserable. 10 is it just couldn't go any better. It's awesome, right? So we're going to start physically, right? One to 10, one's awful. 10's outstanding. Five is average. How's your physical training going? Meaning, how are you doing getting some exercise? How's your, how are you doing drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, eating right, you know, cutting back on the alcohol, cutting back, you know, on the tobacco and the nicotine products, right? There's just a l list of things that you could be cutting back on that can make you better physically. So if you were to tell me right now, all of you out there in the world who are listening to the show, right, if you could tell me what's your number, what would your physical number be? And then the next question is, what are you going to do to change it right now that you, you told me your number right now, wherever you're listening to me from, wherever you're at in this great big world, right? In the 60 plus countries that we have around the world listening to the show, what are you going to do to change it right now that you're going to commit to? Because that's going to be the next step in your training. All right. So you got a physical number. Next number is the mental number. Mentally, how's your training going? Meaning, what are you doing? to grow in your knowledge and understanding and your wisdom. That's what I want to know. How are you, are you reading? What are you, do, what are you doing to really engage yourself in growing your mind on some level? How, how would you rate your training? Right? I mean, you, you know, I'm not, I'm not bragging. It's just part of what I do for the show, but I read a book a week for this show, right? That's what I do because I believe in the training of my mind. All right. That, and by the way, that's a great place to start. If you're not reading, read. But the mistake that we often make is when it comes to our mental training is that we allow things to come at us and we do not 
we are not active participants in our learning. And, and, and Maureen is also going to talk about this later. She's going to talk about that, you know what, as a leader, you better be in constant learning mode. That's part of your training is to be in constant learning mode. Right? If you want to be a great leader, if you want to be great at anything, you better be in constant learning. So what are you doing to learn every day? How would you rate yourself on that training on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 miserable, 10 outstanding, 5 is average. And then what do you need to do to change it? What are you going to commit to? What is your commitment right now? Not your intention, but what you're going to commit to right now that you're going to change. Your, your mental, right? Part of who you are in your training. All right, so you got two numbers, physical, mental. Next one is emotional, right? Do you know what the beautiful thing about Maureen's book is? And by the way, it's called Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations. The beautiful thing about her book is, you know what? Your emotional intelligence is just as important as all your other areas. It's absolutely critical, right? So what do I mean by your emotional training? Well, I'm going to give you some practice tips, all right? Here's a practice tip. When somebody cuts you off in traffic, how well are you able to maintain your emotions? That's practice. You get it? See, you get, so you get a train. You get that opportunity to train when somebody cuts you off. You know, how about when somebody nags at you? That's your training opportunity because you have a choice of how you want to respond. How about when somebody gets in your grill? Can you remain nice? Ooh, see, that's a training opportunity, right? And then there's the other side of it, right? How well are you able, you know, let's say somebody's being really emotional. How well are you able to sit there and listen and really, really understand their emotions? It's training ground, right? Part of training ground is to be able to sit in front of somebody who wants to emotionally emote with you. And then be able to understand the subtleties of all their emotions. That takes requires emotional grammar, but it also takes training. And so when you get those opportunities, you have to take advantage of those opportunities to be right there with them emotionally. And that's that's critical. Right? That's part of your emotional training. So on a scale of one to ten, how are you doing emotionally? When right? Five is average. And then what are you gonna commit to to change yourself in your emotional training? And then finally, there's the spiritual training aspect. What do I mean by the spiritual training? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you move the physical, the mental, the emotional, right? If you move that, what do you have left? Spiritual. And people say, well, I am not spiritual. I, I do not have a spiritual bone in my body. And I go, yeah, you do. I promise you, you do. Because there's things that you cannot explain that touch you in a way that go way beyond your emotions or way beyond your thought process. Beyond that, you know what? Everybody has faith. In something. You believe in something. You go, no, I don't. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, if if you have a vacation or you have plans in your future, that means that you have faith that it's going to happen. Mm. And when you have faith that something is going to happen, that tells me that right away that you have faith in something else. You cannot, you cannot say, I have plans in the future without faith. I guarantee you have faith. You believe in something. You believe that something brings you back to center. You believe that something puts your heart at rest. You believe that something keeps you at peace, right? For some people, it's God. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's maybe it's nature. I don't know what it is for you, but here's what I want to tell you. I promise you, you the have it, and the question is, how is it working for you? That's the question on your training. Because if it's not working for you, just like any other part of your training, if it's not working for you, you know what? You may need to change it. That's the fact. You may need to find another. You may need to find another way to get yourself back to center. So, on a scale of one to ten, how's your spiritual training? And you've heard me say this before. Look, spirituality is not going to church and thinking about fishing. All right, spirituality is going fishing and thinking about God. So, as it comes to your spiritual training, what are you going to commit to? to change, to be better. So there you got your four numbers, right? Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. Think of those legs of the chair. If, we're, if our legs of our chair are uneven, our posture's bad, and it's going to make things hurt down the road. And at the same time, if the legs of the chair are too low, it's going to make create all sorts of issues. And, and besides that, you can't eat at a normal table. So that brings me to the four-part woman, and I love her to death. Her name is... Ms. Maureen Metcalf. She's the founder and CEO and board chair of Innovative Leadership Institute, which is a highly sought after 
Uh, she's a highly sought after expert in anticipating and leveraging future business trends to transform organizations. Organizations, I'll get that out. My tongue is tied. She has captured her 30 years of experience. And by the way, there's no way she's done this for 30 years because she looks like she's just a little over 30 of experience and success in award winning series of books, which um, are used in public, private, and academic situations and organizations to help align company-wide strategy systems and culture with innovative leadership techniques. Uh, she is a preeminent change agent. Maureen has set strategic direction and then transformed her client organizations to deliver significant business results, such as increased profitability, cycle time reduction, improved quality, and increased employee engagement. For years, she's been willing to share her hard-won insights through conference speaking opportunities, industry, industri industry publications, radio talk shows, and such as this, and video presentations. She has an amazing track record uh, where she's working with high-performing clients from the local Ohio small business to the Fortune 15 organizations, such as the U.S. Army, uh, um, and, and to the U.S. Army. Client, her areas of client mainstays include technology, engineering, manufacturing, financial, and medical services. Um, she's also, she also goes over to the United Kingdom and Europe. She, her, she has expertise implementing change in strategic directions, merger acquisition, spin-off divestments, large-scale systems, installation, business, re-engineering, governance, and success planning. Oh my gosh, she does it all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the show, and welcome back to A New Direction, Maureen Metcalf. Welcome, Maureen. Jay, thank you so much. I am delighted to be here with you. There is no place I would rather be at this moment than with you and with your listeners. Well, thank you. You know what? We uh, we love having you. Literally, I had so many people either come to me personally or come to me or write me saying, gosh, she's really good. Can you get her back? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to get her back? And I, when you agreed pretty quickly that you would, uh, I was like, yeah, well, she, she agreed. She, she doesn't know what she's getting herself into, but that's okay. We'll let her go do it. As anyway, um, the the book, by the way, the book is awesome. I, I told you I've read this thing probably four, maybe five times. I don't even know how many times I've read it. I keep reading it. The Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations. And, you know, you come out of the book. You, you do talk about that. We, you know, we talked about this last time that it's, everything is moving so fast. And now that we're in the midst of a pandemic, things are even moving faster, especially if you're in leadership. Yeah, for sure. But I had something hit me in this book this time as my as I'm reading through it that didn't hit me before, and I called it leadership insanity. And and I pulled it right out of your book. You never said it exactly in these terms, but we know we all know the statement that that. Albert Einstein made that was, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But you say this in this book in pretty much a very similar fashion, that if you as a leader expect that you can do the same thing that you've been doing as a leader over and over and over again, and expect your people to change and expect your organization to change, that's, that's leadership insanity. Have I, did I miss it? You got it exactly right. And and it is even more poignant with the pandemic, right? That that people who were brilliantly successful up until February are, are hitting a wall where the world has, ch the, the ecosystem has changed and the things they did to make them brilliantly successful in many cases aren't working like they used to. And now, certainly some of the things people do continue to work, but others don't. And so it's about elevating or updating how we lead. So, yes, you hit it dead on. You know, one of the things that I was telling we, you and I were talking before the show, one of the things that struck me before the show was that I just it just blew my mind was that for the first time I'm a big sports guy. I love sports. But for the first time in my life, I finally understood that sometimes why coaches have to be fired, because I would say, you know, the players, it's not the players problem. Right. The players, you know, the, 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 I mean, it's the players problem. The coach is one guy. You've got, you know, X number of players out there. You know, they're the ones. Right. But then I started thinking about it from your book's standpoint and going, yeah, but your 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 organization is only as good as your leadership. And if you're yeah. and if and, and if your leadership is failing or if the people are no longer, I guess, following or you're no longer inspiring them to some sort of change, then it really does fall on the leader then, doesn't it? 
Well, even worse, if the people are following and what the leader's doing is is no longer effective, mm. then you really suboptimize the investment the organization is making and the stewardship responsibility the organization has for all of these people who show up to give their best effort. And if the leader isn't effective, they're giving their best effort for the wrong or, or for a suboptimum outcome. It, it's probably not the wrong outcome, but the, either the approach or something that's happening is less effective than it used to be. And, and that it impacts everyone in the system. Mm. Every stakeholder is impacted. Yeah, that's that's this is the problem. You know, um, I'm not going to use it, but you know, they say stuff runs downhill, <laughs> right? I mean, mm-hmm. right, right. I mean, yeah. and it, it. But when you start, when I start reading your book again, I started going. Well, you know what? It's absolutely true. And 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 the problem then becomes, you know, are we as leaders? so dense to ourselves that we, and I I guess this is a question for you. Are we so dense in ourselves that we don't even realize that we're stuck in our ways to the point that we can't get out? Is that, is that our problem? I I think the problems cross a range. Uh, Let me give a story of a senior executive who was a a friend, uh, not a client. Um, And he was not a client because his point of view was, I'm brilliantly successful. Why a seven-figure, eight-figure salary, kind of amazingly well compensated. Um, Why would I talk to a coach to change anything about what I'm doing? It's working. Mm. Um, He got a big job offer, left the, the role um, so I, I didn't interact with him anymore and he was fired within a year for non-performance. Um, it, often people, well, as humans, we have all kinds of reasons we don't want to change for some people. They don't have, it doesn't make the value propositions, not there. Mm. I'm going to invest my time in learning and growing, right. but why would I, I don't have to. Yeah, I, yeah I, you know, the human factor of this is, you know, as a psychological professional, Maureen, one of the things that really clicks in my head is how stubborn we are to change. We we just really are resistant to change because we kind of like, we kind of like oftentimes sitting in our own dysfunction, you know, and right You know, so I'll share a bit of a personal story. Um, My dad was a Vietnam vet. Uh, He did two tours of duty. And so he came back with what we would now call PTSD. Growing up in that environment, that was normal for me. So he was a little emotionally sensitive. Um, And so we, as as the kids, especially kind of um, were very careful around dad not to upset him in a way that is not normal for kids of those ages. Mm. Um, so as I grew up, I c- continued to contort myself in my own head about what was, quote, normal. Mm. When I had to face the fact that that was, uh, my upbringing was not, um, from a psychological perspective, wasn't healthy, mm. then it forced me to either continue to live in that kind of illusory world or face all of the things that that upbringing did to me to make my habits ineffective. I'm not blaming my dad. He served his com- country very honorably. Unfortunately, that service in his case impacted us as kids. And so it's my responsibility now as an adult to um, attend to my own inner workings to to bring them to a place that is healthy for me as an adult and a leader. And so I think often as humans, we, we are um, dented is my very pedestrian word. Um, we become dented over the course of life and it, we just have to go get the dents pulled out. <laughs> Which by the way, is not, sometimes it's not only not easy, but it's also can be very painful. <laughs> 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> Imagine sure. being the fender of that car I just ran into a post. <laughs> the fender hurts. Yeah. Well, and getting it pulled back out hurts too, by the way. It's not exactly yeah. it's not exactly yeah. pleasant either. By the way, we're with Maureen Metcalf and she is the author and of this book, a great book entitled Innovative Leaders Guide to Transforming Organizations. And you're listening to her here on a new direction. Hey, everyone, you know, New Direction has a couple great sponsors, right? And uh, Epic Physical Therapy is one of them. And whether you're recovering from an injury or surgery or you're suffering every day, aches and pains, or maybe you're having difficulty performing activities of daily living, maybe maybe you're an athlete and you just are not performing at the level you want to perform at, you know what, here, you, you can go to the elite team at Epic Physical Therapy. I'll tell you why. I use them and here's why I do. Because they will provide you with a customized treatment plan tailored to your individual needs. See, they understand that, you know, when they rehab, you know, young athletes to professional athletes, they they understand that they have to treat the entire body as a functional whole. They can't just treat the symptom or the injury. So look, when you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery, and your epic results, you know what, don't go any further. Start with Epic Physical Therapy, and you can learn more by going to epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors, for 35 years, they have been helping people all over the world uh, find their dream home or find the find their dream home or sell their dream home, right? And the reason why they've been at the top of the game for 35 years is because they have one really great edge. And you know what it is? Relationships. They really do believe in relationships. They believe in the power of the personal relationship. They believe also that your home is more than just a physical number that you purchased. They understand that probably you're going to go your whole life remembering things that happened in your home. I mean, think about it. How many of you can remember your grandma's house? Does anybody remember how much she paid for it? Probably not. But we all do remember those memories, don't we? And Linda understands that those memories were created in that home. So she wants to take care of it the same way that you took care of it. And so that's why they call her the memory maker, the relationship maker. So if you're ready to sell your home or buy your next home, why not go to the Legends of Customer Service? That's what her clients call her. Why not go to lindacraft.com? That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on A New Direction with Maureen Metcalf and uh, her outstanding book, which I just love, Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations. I think I've read it. Matter of fact, and not only did I not only do I have a, co- a physical copy of it, but I also I also purchased it on Kindle so that I could refer back to it. So um, make sure that you get your paperback or your Kindle version. It's it's a great book. I'm just telling you, it's going to be useful for you as a leader. Matter of fact, the reason, one of the reasons why I had to get it on Kindle is I loaned it to one of my clients to have them read and and look through leadership and they never gave it back to me. And so I had to get the Kindle version and, and read the Kindle version again. And so uh, I'm glad that we did. So, you know what? I know that we've got a plan. Maureen and I have a plan. Leave it to Maureen. Maureen (laughs) Maureen loves plans. And so we, we came up with a plan of how we're going to do the show today. And so we're going to talk about the five elements of innovative leadership and we talked a little bit about a couple of the, fir- the first two a little bit, leadership type and development. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you a real brief overview of leader type and developmental perspective and, and just to give you full understanding. And then we're going to move to resilience, situation analysis, and leadership behaviors. And so let's talk about what this leadership, this, the, the five elements, and why is it a pyramid? First of all, why is it, why is it a pyramid? Why did you make it a pyramid anyway? It, it may be because I'm not creative enough, but, but the, <laughs> I was um, not expecting that. That's not but, but, but but there is there is thought behind it. So so the the foundation is our personality type, I, and I especially as a psychotherapist, um, I'm sure you have a point of view on type. Sure. The reason we use it is um, that in a lead, there is. PhD level research about understanding personality type right. in leader development. Right. It's not that it is so precise that it drives everything I do, but it gives me tools to become more self-aware. Sure. And when I work with people 
other people who use the same diagnostic tool. I happen to use the Enneagram, but that's mainly because uh, my co-author is an expert in the Enneagram. Right. So um, it's it's a very useful tool, and that's the tool the doctoral level research was done on. It, by no stretch do I think it's the only or the best. It is a a tool that has been researched in leader development, and that's that's one of the rationales. Why we care about it is all of us have a set of predispositions uh, that are mostly shaped by the time we're an adult. And again, Jay, you can talk far more uh, than I can and, and certainly more informed about how they change. In the leadership space, I make the assumption that unless there's a dramatic change, people tend to remain the type they are. So understanding who I am, who you are, and how we relate is helpful. The second piece is foundational to leader type for me. It is that once I understand my predispositions, I can mature. So leadership maturity, I can mature each of those uh, preferences. So an example, I'm an introvert. Um, I so I'm okay in the pandemic. I'm I am very happy on <laughs> Skype with you today. <laughs> when I first started speaking, I think at my first paid speaking engagement, the microphone didn't work properly. People left. I secretly wanted them all to leave. I was so uncomfortable. <laughs> I didn't ask them to leave, but I was confused about why anyone stayed because they couldn't hear me. <laughs> That's I needed to kind of build some maturity around right. my introversion. Right, right. And and part of why the, there are a few reasons this is really important. Um, having worked with MBA students for now decades, um, what I hear from them often is I thought my personality type meant that I couldn't be effective outside of that type. It was a, um, more of a firm boundary than a preference. Mm -hmm. and, and as we learn about maturity, I can mature, I can grow up my personality basically so that I have, a, so it's a preference, but it's not a restriction. Right. Right. I think that's, that. I think that's critical for people to understand. I, you know, I, first of all, I think that we all are built with a set of bents, okay? Meaning that we're bent to go in a particular direction. How we how we arrive at what those are, I, there's just as you said, there's so many tools. I happen to be a fan of the Enneagram, by the way. I happen to be a fan of Myers Briggs. I, I happen to be a fan of several uh, different instruments. I, I happen to be a fan if you combine all of them. Uh, I think that's also a useful tool as well. I happen to be a fan of these because I think a lot of times we just don't know ourselves very well. And I think what these tools really are supposed to do is help us to understand ourselves a little bit deeper because we have a shallow, such a shallow view of who we are. Meaning when I say that, meaning, well, we go kind of go, I am what I am. And we really don't dig much further beyond that. And I think the, yeah. the tools that, w that you present here in the book, which I, I, I love and I, I, I really do. I think are really just really to help dig beyond that surface of, well, I am what I am. I'm, you know, I can't, I can't change it. The truth of the matter is, well, you may not be able to change your, your bent, your, your full bent, but you know, you can tweak it quite a bit. You, you still have a lot of choices within your own personality of what you can choose or not choose to do. And I think that's, I think that's the, I think that's really to me, you know, is part of this whole idea of, okay, I am born with certain, certain elements in my personality. I get that, but, but I can tweak a lot of these things just by making different choices. Right. I can, yeah. And even more than that, given a, a concerted and deliberate development program, I, I can not only grow beyond my personality, but bring in significant additional right. capacity than I had if I weren't deliberately developing. Right. 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 Which, which by the way, so if, 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 uh, if the first by the base, the very foundation of the pyramid, which is what we've been talking about, if that's the, that's the leader type, 
All right, that moves us to the layer right on top of the foundation, which is our developmental part, the developmental part, mm-hmm. which is, is, is the importance of the developmental perspective is what is what you title in chapter two. And you, you use a term here, it says meaning making or how you make sense of experiences. Uh, it's important because the algorithm you use to make sense of the world influences your thoughts and actions. Help pull this together, the developmental perspective, that layer on top of the personality piece, the leader type. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Sure. You and I, I, I think, are the same age. Yeah. Um, I don't so know if how. you think back to when you graduated from college, you uh, were 20, 21? Yeah, 21, 22. Yeah. It took me, it took me an extra semester because I screwed around my first semester. <laughs> we, admire, we admire that. Parents don't always, but. Yeah, yeah. No, I um, took an extra semester. So my guess is when you got out of college, you thought you had the world figured out. Well, I was smarter than my parents were for certain, and I was certainly <laughs> smarter than anybody that I'd ever worked for, and I was certainly smarter than my sister, and um, smarter than a whole bunch of people until I went to grad school. Okay, so your meaning-making algorithm when you graduated with, from college was the level, um, and, and there are different labels for these terms. Um, I'm using the ones that come out of Bill Torbert's article published in HBR. Mm -hmm. So Harvard Business Review, just so we have a level set. So when you came out of college, you were at the developmental level of expert, which is, (laughs) I, I, right. I know everything. (laughs) It's so Um, sad. It's so sad that you put it like that, but yes. (laughs) Right. And I'm not introspective because if I become introspective, it um, reveals that I really don't know everything. Right. So those go together. I'm I know everything and I'm not introspective. So my meaning making algorithm is that of uh, someone who is focused on developing external expertise. And that's my value in the world. Right. It's very self-serving, isn't it? I mean, because it, it's it's ex- extraordinarily selfish and self-serving. Well, it's if we think about the levels of maturity, that's an appropriate level of maturity for a twenty-year-old. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are fifty and still that way, right. you are self-centered. If you're twenty <laughs> in that way, you're normal. <laughs> I got to tell you something. There's a lot of 50 year olds listening to the show and you know who you are. And I got to tell you something. She just called you out. You are selfish. Okay. I just want to let you know that you are selfish out there. Some of you 50 somethings. I'm just saying, just saying. So one of the other parts of this piece, right, of the developing the developmental perspective for myself and developing that, but also I have to kind of develop uh, this perspective of others, right? Isn't that kind of the, there's a developmental piece of understanding Mm -hmm. other people as well and how we interact. So, so as I go through the, the, and this gets back to the meaning making. So as, as an expert, my making sense of the world is all through this, um, aperture in a, think of a camera aperture. Mm -hmm. It's a small one. Right. I, I'm I think task, not process. I think three months to a year. Right. I may use the words long term, but my my um, the way I cal- calculate is really fairly small. Right? Again, appropriate to a 20 year old. Right. As I mature, I am able to literally from the psychology perspective, able to take additional person perspectives. So I'm able to, and now in a conversation, and I assume you and I both do this just naturally, I wonder what you're going on, what's going on for you. I think about um, when I say something, how will that make you feel? That becomes then wired in a a bigger, um, Going back to your physical, emotional, spiritual, the my emotional intelligence comes online as I mature to a, a later or more mature level. Yeah, right. Because, I mean, okay, I think there's a couple things in in there. I mean, because there's, there's I'm gonna I'm gonna just kind of pull out a couple pieces here. So I think the first thing is, I am I am concerned about what is important to you first of all and mm-hmm. yeah. how, how that I think I think there's 
there because I want it. I want it to be important to you. I want what I'm doing on the show right now is, you know, am I asking an intelligent enough question that's important to you? But I'm also considering the listener, right? I'm also considering, I I I want it to be something that's useful for them. And I know here's the other thing, because you and I have done this before and we have chatted, uh, and we are both concerned that whoever's listening to the show, that are we giving you something that is helping you grow? Because we, you and I are both about growth at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And so we take that into consideration. And I think that that does make meaning, right? Because for both of us, right? Doesn't that, is, am, am I missing what you're trying to get at in the developmental perspective or I missed it? You got it. Okay. So at the expert level at 20 years old, you made sense of the world based on your limited experience of the world. Mm-hmm. At 50 you have a much broader experience of the world and your thinking and emotional intelligence and spiritual awareness Mm -hmm. and, and fitness have all expanded your aperture. So now when you have the same thing happen to you at 50 that you did at 20, your, how you interpret it will be different. So, so the example you gave in the, the intro, someone cuts you off, Right. Um, I heard you laugh at, at that. 20, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> at 20, I may have said, that guy's out to get me. Right. Or, you know, it might have been personal. He's a jerk. Now, I he's a jerk. The, yeah. Right. Well, I may still think he's a jerk. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I more consider, is that person having a bad day? Right. Are they, um, when I drive by and observe them, are they even safe to drive sometimes? Um, what, what experience are they having in the world? I don't try to run them off the road. Um, what I, I was a really aggressive 20 year old driver. Um, I actually had someone jump out of their car and shake a, um, tire iron at me. Mm. I don't do that now. I, I've kind of grown up and the meaning making grows up too. Right. No, I, I, I get it. Her name's uh, Maureen Metcalf, by the way, you're listening to here on A New Direction and, uh, her book, by the way, you gotta get it. You got to get it. Seriously, you got to get the book. It's called Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations. Seriously, you've got to get this book. She's got a series of books, right? So if you're in nonprofits as well, you can actually get her nonprofit version. And she's just got, they're just all over Amazon, bookstores, everywhere, right? Just pick it up. It's a Kindle paperback. I'm just telling you, you need to pick up this book. It's, 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 I, like I've told you, I've read it four or five times. I've given it, gave it away to one of my coaching clients and they never gave it back. So, well, what are you going to do? So you have to buy the Kindle version. <laughs> it's just it's as simple <laughs> as that. And you go on and, and you move that. I want to quote from this particular chapter is you, you say this. In order for you to be successful as a leader over the long run, it is essential to understand your proper fit within the organization, which includes understanding who you are and what you value, where you belong in the organization, and where you belong within the broader team and community stakeholders. It is also important to apply this concept to others as you are making hiring decisions, assigning people to roles, determining individual roles within a team, and communicating with others. Expand on this because I found that to be a very powerful quote from you. Thank you because I think this is one of the most important characteristic or most important ethical um, pieces of using developmental psychology. Uh, people tend to, in our society, say more is better, higher is better. You've got a graduate degree. You are smarter, um, whatever it is. You, you're you a CEO. You're probably better than a VP, better than a director. Um, from, the, from the lens of developmental psychology, where I am on the developmental spectrum indicates where I best fit in the organization. Mm-hmm. If I am a strategist level, I am going to be more effective at a senior role. I have a longer time horizon, more complexity of thinking. By the way, I'm less inclined to follow rules. Right. Um, I, I am better fit at that executive role. I am less effective at, at a role that is um, more rote or routine. Mm-hmm. So if if I so back to our com- conversation about experts and and um, folks uh, straight out of college, I shouldn't have been in a leadership role. I didn't didn't know stuff. Right. Um, right. I didn't. Right. I I knew economic theory. Right. Um, 
I knew how to use a spreadsheet. I should not have been making decisions. And, you know, the good news is the company I was working for didn't, you know, didn't offer me those senior executive roles. Um, <laughs> as we, so it's what I'm trying to integrate here were two messages. Hire is not better. Hire right. is better at senior leadership roles. Not everyone wants those roles. Not everyone should have those roles. Wherever we are on the developmental progression, there is a right fit job for us. It, it, in, I almost want to do a dating analogy, right? If you are a seven foot tall basketball player, you may want to date someone who is of equal physical stature. Right. If you are a five foot three piano player, you're probably not dating a seven foot three tennis player. Right. Right. The, 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 we fit well based on um, our beliefs, our values, our professions, right. uh, similar with the developmental piece. There are several factors that go into fit for role. It is not only do I have the technical skills, it's also the level of, of leadership or individual maturity that I demonstrate. So um, when I talk about succession planning, there are a couple things I think about. Um, for individual people I'm coaching, where do you want to be in the world? And then how do you move through the developmental levels to get there if you're not already there? Right. If I'm trying to fill a role, um, because um, so think about the meaning making and developmental levels. Um, part of one of the characteristics is complexity of thinking. So even your simple example about how do we think about listeners, you're thinking about what do I want? I'm thinking about what do you want? We're both thinking about listeners. We're thinking about what do they need now? What do they need after the pandemic? Right. Um, who are they going to share this with? So we're thinking second, third, fourth order of detail. Right. Those are the, that's the thought process that one needs for a senior level role Again, not everyone's there and not everyone should be there. But if I'm trying to hire someone for a senior role, I need to be looking at more than um, how, how profitable their last P&L was. Right. Her name is Maureen Metcalf. Is she, is she awesome? Gosh, she's awesome. Her book's entitled Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations. And you're listening to her here on A New Direction. Hey, folks, you know, we talk about them, you know, epic physical therapy. You know why? Because I really do love them. Look, here's one of the reasons. <laughs> well, a couple more reasons. Actually, a lot more reasons. I really like epical physical therapy because they offer the most advanced top-of-the-line equipment. That's one of the one of the reasons. You know, they have the anti-gravity treadmill, which takes the pressure off your joints so that you can go ahead and you can run if you're a runner. I happen not to be a runner, but... But you know what? It still takes pressure off your joints. It's pretty cool. There's the Normatec compression sleeves, which makes you feel like, you know what? Your joints are all held together again. And then there's the Game Ready, which is this ice-cold, pressurized uh, wrap around your joints, and it just takes all the, the all the swelling out of it. It's just amazing. I love it. Not only that, they are trained and certified in the most comprehensive cutting-edge treatments available, including blood flow restriction therapy, otherwise known as BFR, dry needling, which is cool. By the way, it, it, you think it's acupuncture. It's really not. It's dry needling. And what they do is it actually gives you a lot of pain relief. It's really amazing. And then there's cupping, which is how they manipulate the muscle through the skin. And so you may see circles on people's back or legs or whatever. Well, it's probably from cupping. Look, when you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery and epic results, you know what? Start no further than by going to Epic Physical Therapy. And you can learn more by going to Epic pt.com that's epicpt.com and linda craft and team realtors you know what located in raleigh north carolina they actually which is known as the research triangle park by the way which is what they help which is raleigh durham chapel hill and the surrounding area it's over a million people look but they've been helping people around the world and how do you how do you do that you know if you're living in this one area of the u.s how do you help people all over the world well i'll tell you how linda did it for 35 years and how she continues to do it well first of all she doesn't belong to any sort of national company. She is her own company. So that gives her the opportunity to meet mm. realtors from all different companies so that she can find the best expert to help you match up wherever you live without being loyal, having to be loyal to a particular company or group because she is her own company. She's not franchised. So that makes it really, really great for you that when you want to start with somebody who's unbiased, 
somebody who has searched through the myriad names that are in your area, she could tell you who the best expert is in your area. Not only that, there's a reason when you are at the top of your game for 35 years, you must be doing something right. You have to admit that, right? Because most companies are gone after 30 years. But if you can stay at the top of your real estate game for 35 years, there's something that you're doing really, really well. And you know what that is? She understands the power of the relationship and the power that the memories have in a home. So when you're ready to talk to somebody who really understands how important your home is to you, that it's more than just a business transaction, that it's a life transaction, then talk to Linda and her team. And you can learn more by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here with Maureen Metcalf and uh, here on A New Direction and Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations. And um, we made a promise that we were going to buzz through this quickly. And we, we of course, are not. We, not, <laughs> we haven't. We haven't. But we are going to. We're going to move on. So we have we have talked about the developmental perspective, which is on top of the leader type. And now we're going to move up to that middle layer, the resilience layer in Chapter 3. So... You know, you come right out of the chute in this chapter saying, okay, there's that farm boy part of me right out of the chute. You come right out of the, you come right out of the, come right out of the gate with it going, as a leader, you need to be physically and emotionally healthy to do a good job. And actually, I talk about, I think the four legs of the stool that you talk yes, about you in the intro. Yep, you do. So manage your physical well-being. Right. Manage your thinking. Yes. If I am obsessing over things... I need to find a way to manage my emotion or my thinking because negative thinking causes physical, physiological yeah. response. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, so, and, and significant physiological oh, response. God, yes. Yep. So yeah. I can't be physically healthy if I'm walking around obsessing all day. Then, then there is managing the power of connection right. and managing my emotions. Right. And um, I group emotions and spiritual having a sense of purpose together. Right. Um, so I need to have, again, to your point, it's not religious, but it, I have to believe in something bigger than myself. Right. And I have to be aware of my emotions and manage them. And it, it, walking around in an interconnected body, if any of these are off balance, then I will, my physical health will suffer. My thinking will be unclear. And um, there, there is good data about the impact of being sleep deprived being similar to having the functionality of a drunk driver. Yep, it is. So. Um, so it's not like I can be clear thinking when I'm not sleeping well. Right. It's not like I can be clear thinking when I am putting myself in um, a constant turmoil because I'm obsessing over what my boss did or what my employee did or what my spouse did or or that spin takes my brain offline. Right. So – Without managing all of those collectively, we can't maintain our health, we can't maintain our functioning, and ultimately, even beyond being a good leader, just being a good human being for your family right. or for your friends, take care of yourselves. Well, you, you talk about, you know, you talk about the elements of resilience and, you know, you, and I, I have been using this for years since I started the show that we are going to open up the show every day, check in with everybody and find out where they're at. Because I really am a firm believer that we we need to check in at, regularly, find out where we're at in these four areas. And you call mm -hmm. it, you know, the maintaining your physical well-being, managing thinking, using emotional intelligence to fulfill your life purpose, and then harnessing the power of connection. And uh, listen, I think you could you could, in my opinion, based on what I read you know, using int emotional intelligence for f to fulfill life purpose and harness the power of connection. To me, if you kind of combine those to a piece of each of those together, that comes up with the spiritual area. That's kind of, I could take the element of both of those and create the spiritual piece from that. But I, 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 re people do not understand in the leadership realm because I run into a lot of leaders who do not physically take care of themselves and they make excuses for it. 
go ahead. I could I could see your chomping oh. at the bit to go for it. <laughs> well, so think about we as a society seem to reward workaholics and martyrs. Yeah, so sure. so we get the message that if you are taking time to go work out, you're not as dedicated to your work. Right, right, right. I, yeah, we we excuse. Do you know? I really believe that you know we blame kids for fast food. I don't believe that fast food is a kid problem. I believe that fast food is a leadership problem. Well, yeah, because kids aren't driving to McDonald's. <laughs> No, they're not. That's the point. Do you know how many people, do you know how many executives I go, dude, did you just, did you just go to a fast food restaurant? You couldn't make a better eating choice. Right? I don't have time. You know, I need to eat. I just need to eat. I'm like going, yeah, but there's just better choices than what you're making. And, mm-hmm. and, and we're, and, and I keep, golly, it's just, it, I, it just, it frustrates me to no end because one of the simplest things that you can do is actually take care of your body. You know, mental stuff can be a little hard. I get it, right? You, you know, because mentally it can be challenging, but you can get through it. Emotionally, it can be a challenge because, you know, we kind of like to go with the flow with our emotions. We don't want to have to control them. We want, we Oftentimes, and by the way, wrongly, we think that I got to just let out my anger. By the way, when you get, when you let out more anger, guess what you become? Research shows us you become more angry is what happens as you let out more anger. Hmm. And the research is clear on this. So every time people go, well, I got to let out my anger. No, you have to channel your anger. If you Hmm, went, brilliant point. If you went to the gym with your anger and you hit the heavy bag, that's fine. But when you continually scream and yell and post and be angry things on social media, all you're doing is you're getting yourself more angry. This is, it's a way big difference psychologically. And mm. then and then this this whole idea of harnessing the power of connection, we've got to be connected. We we have we have a human basic need to be connected to things that are beyond ourselves, which includes people and other things. It, we just got to be connected to it. It's it's who we are as people, so you do cover these things. But I think the thing that the think the thing that got me in this particular piece is when you and you brought it up, and so I'm going to go with it, is life purpose while living your values. Talk about that because Daniel Daniel Goleman, who I love by the way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know he talks about emotions impact. You, you talk about it, emotions impact reasoning and decision making, making and if neglected can derail your ability to implement well structured plans. And that our emotions are contagious and impact others, which they do. But the purpose piece, talk to us about the purpose aspect of it. So I'm going to tie this back to developmental maturity again. Um, As we move through the levels, we get a clearer sense of what we're here for. The more I'm able to continue to anchor back to that. And, And, you know, at 20, again, my sense of what I was here for was to get a better car and have a house. Right. Um, at 50 plus, my sense of what I'm here for is how do I impact the world? Right. Um, it, what it is is less important than the fact that I am connecting to it. Right. And it is guiding my decision making. So it helps me prioritize a, and not get as wrapped around the axle about things that aren't on the critical path. If it's not on the critical path, I shouldn't be letting it upset me other than slow drivers. <laughs> We're talking with Marie Metcalf. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm laughing because I was not expecting that from you. Well played. Well done. Uh, <laughs> she's the author of Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming Organizations. All right. So let's let's move on to the next layer, right? The next layer of this pyramid is situational analysis, right? And it's understanding the organi- organization's background or context is equally as important as the other three. Let's talk about what what situation analysis is and why is that part of the pyramid? Okay, so so we've now we've gone from the inside out. So inside I have personality type, and then I have how I mature. So so type is kind of influenced out of my control for the most part. Uh, what I do with it and how I mature it, I have more control over then resilience is both inside and outside. And when I say inside, I can't look at you and say, Jay's a 
Enneagram achiever type because I don't know. Um, I can listen to you and probably come up with more information. Right. Same with developmental maturity. When you walk by me going down the street, I can't tell unless you do something ridiculous. Right. Um, resilience, I start to be able to tell because it, it is things internal like thinking. It's also external like um, I take care of myself. Right. Situational analysis then starts to bring those all together. So it it is... Um, Knowing who I am and what I stand for, behaving in a way that is aligned with what I stand for. Now I bring in the organization. I understand the organization's culture, right. so its values. Uh, so, so the like I have the inside of me, my own beliefs and values. I have the inside of the organization beliefs, values, norms, and then I have the outside. So I've got my behaviors. And the organization's behaviors, which look more like systems, processes, um, technology, buildings, the external observable, and why this matters. As a leader, I need to make sure that when I am making changes, and I either big organization or the team I'm a part of, when I change one piece, everything is impacted. Mm. So um, we put in a new computer system that it will change a little bit of our culture about maybe how we interact with one another. It will change a little bit of my behavior about how I perform my task. And it may even impact something in my values about how I see myself as a contributor to the team. So, as a leader, I need to attend to all of those and ensure they stay in alignment, which ends up being complex when we're making a lot of concurrent changes. Yeah, yeah, no, yes, You're, it gets really, it gets really bogged down, right? Because we're making so many changes, mm -hmm. right? That we have to untangle it. Then <laughs> I feel like I feel like we have to kind of untangle because we're making so mm -hmm. many changes. We don't know what's working, what's not working. So then add to that, um, as a leader, how I behave right. will be different depending on, on the situation in which I'm working. So you mentioned elite military forces. Right. They will likely behave differently when they're on a mission than they do when they're back in the office training. Right. And, and they will behave differently than... Um, my university clients, right? So, right. so how I show up as a leader will depend also on all of the elements within the system. Got it. By the way, you just completed the whole pyramid. No, behaviors are last. Oh, but, oh okay. So, all right. So, let's talk about behaviors real quick. Let's talk about leadership behavior. Cause I thought you were talking about leadership behaviors. I thought you were pulling them both together. I thought that's what you were doing. So we got it. Oh, sorry. No, no, oh. no, 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 no. So, okay. Got it. So, all right. So let's talk about how that differentiates itself and what leadership behaviors. Okay. So, so let's go back to what you just said. So behaviors, um, when we look at level four behaviors are in there and right. they're influenced by the, the situation and, and who I am and what I value. Now we pull them up to the top of the pyramid and look just at leader behaviors. Ah. So now. Got it. So as a leader, the, the, what we believe is most effective, but, but, and this is the tricky bit. This is what we as researchers believe is most effective to lead large complex organizations or um, small and sometimes complex organizations. Um, it's what we think is most effective, but in some contexts, it will not be rewarded. Mm. So if the organization is an immature organization, it won't want a mature leader. Mm. Mm. That's, that's why situational analysis is before behaviors. Mm. Got it. Do you realize our hour's up? Can you believe how I do. <laughs> It's, we just did not get – we did not get to what we wanted to get to. I, I don't know. Do we need to bring you back again at some point in the future? Do we just need to do this again? Do we need to do it with another book? I, do we need to do another book with you and just do it again in the future? 
Well, we can do just the leader behaviors, and we have a chapter in the book, Leadership 2050. So this is new, newer content than what's okay. published in um, the Innovative Leader's Guide to Transforming okay. Organizations. Uh, and I think it is it is worth the conversation. It builds on the strategist level of maturity, and specifically at this point in history, and this circles back to the beginning of the conversation, what leaders need to be doing now is not the same thing. They could strategist behavior has been effective for a long time. Right. Many people who weren't that were still effective. Now it's not optional for many organizations. They need it. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it makes sense. Her name is Maureen Metcalf, and she has been brilliant uh, as always. The book is entitled Innovative Leaders Guide to Transforming Organizations. Buy it, right? By the way, Maureen, uh, I know that you do a lot of consulting and you're doing it virtually. You still consult virtually. How do, can people get a hold of you? I will, of course, put the links into the post, but tell people how they can get a hold of you if they want to get some consulting help with leadership. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, there are a couple ways you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Maureen Metcalf. Um, it, there may be more than one of me, but certainly if you look at the profile, you'll see the books and Innovative Leadership Institute. Uh, go to the website, innovativeleadershipinstitute.com, or email me directly, and the email is different than the website, is how about do info, I-N-F-O, just for information, at innovateleader.com, and that will also come directly to me. I but will- I'll know it came from Jay's show. Right. I will. You know what? I'll post that in the blog post as well. In, Thank so it's you. info at innovateleader.com. Yes. It's a, just a little shorter than yeah. Innovative Leadership Got Institute. It. Got it. We will do that and we'll put that on the show. We also put the link to the website so that people can get that. And of course, links to the book. Folks, that's the show. You know what I say every week, right? Be inspired because when you're inspired, that means that you will be inspired to want to inspire others and then they become inspired and they want to inspire others and that can make this world a great place. I'll be back next week with another great guest, another great book, and another great show. And as I say to you every week, ciao, everybody. To go a different way, yeah. The time has come for a new direction. your confidence and the answers don't make sense you got to keep your hope alive you got to know you can survive this is your time to find a new direction a brand new day a new direction things are gonna change Your dreams will take you places you have never been before. Find your passion, find your